Hi everyone, and you're very welcome to this fourth uh, session of Transform Work uh, this week. Uh, my name is Idel Conway and I'm Professor of Human Resource Management and Organisational Psychology here at DCU Business School. Um, and I'm also leader of the Future of Work strand within the Irish Institute of Digital Business. Um, and I'm delighted to be MC today for our speaker panel. And I'm joined by James Duggan and Dr. Neil Humphreys. Uh, as you may know, the Transform series uh, is a free online seminar series that explores the impact of, of digitalization on work and wider business and society. And we're covering a number of areas as part of the series, including, for example, smart cities and communities, uh, the circular economy um, and changing consumers. And today, however, we're going to focus on the future of work. Uh, and so I'm delighted to be joined by James Duggan, who's an Irish Research Council research scholar, PhD scholar at uh, Cork University Business School and University College Cork, and by Dr. Neve Humphreys, who's a reader in uh, health health uh, systems research at the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. Um, and we're going to look at the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 8, which is around decent work and economic growth. And I hope today you'll find it very interesting that we have a contrast between two very different types of workers. Um, so James will focus on app workers uh, who are managed by algorithm, and Neve will focus on uh, the the work experiences of junior doctors in Ireland and abroad. Um, so please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A function, just to note that the chat function is disabled. So please use uh, the Q&A function uh, for any questions. And please also use the uh, hashtag transform work um, if you're going to tweet um, uh, any of the uh, ideas or insights from today. So um, yeah, without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce you to James Duggan. Hi, James. Hi, Edel, and thank you for the introduction. And, and just while I'm sharing my screen here, guys, I, I wanted to say also thank you to Edel for the invite and also thank you to uh, Molly and everyone at the IIDB for uh, the invite to, to contribute and get involved in, in such a fantastic week of, uh, of seminars, which organizing this is, is no mean feat in the climate we're in right now. So uh, thank you once again. So as Edel mentions, uh, my research, I'm a PhD researcher at the Cork University Business School, and my research focuses on work in the gig economy. And particularly, I suppose, the domain that I'm in is uh, human resource management and also employment relations. And one particular strand of my research looks at this idea of decent work and I suppose that the quest for decent work in the gig economy and when I first spoke to to Edel and also to Neve about designing the content for this seminar uh, I'll admit that I was quite challenged in terms of figuring out where exactly to start and where to stop in terms of, of the discussion and the debate on work in the gig economy and whether or not it's decent and and the various debates there. So I hope you find the next couple of minutes interesting and, and towards the end with, with Q&A and whenever else, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts and your insights and your own perspectives on this type of work and what you think the future holds. So moving on to, I, I suppose, introducing the gig economy, we often hear it described as being a new perspective on the world of work, workers, and also workplaces. But what exactly does this mean? And essentially, there are various definitions for what exactly the gig economy is or what it entails, but a very simple one and a widely used one that we can uh, use to understand what the gig economy is, is an online system or an economic system rather that uses online platforms to digitally connect on demand freelance workers with customers to perform fixed term tasks. So there's very little commitment here. It's payment on a piece rate basis and, and generally quite precarious in that sense. And where did it come from? Well, essentially, it's it's quite a new concept and quite a new term. And the term itself was coined uh, following the 2008 financial crisis by a, a journalist, Tina Brown, uh, for the New Yorker magazine. And it was basically used to describe the fragmentation, the increasing fragmentation of work and the eradication of lifelong uh, full-time traditional employment uh, and, and, and acknowledging the, the increasing desire for flexibility in working arrangements. So in terms of what exactly gig work is, then it's, it's much easier to understand what it is than to define it, to define it specifically. So it exists in various forms. And this is quite an important thing to, uh, to recognize at the early stages of discussing the gig economy. So we might associate organi organizations such as Airbnb with the gig economy, but from a work and employment perspective, uh, there is no really clear intensive labor process here for people uh, you know, renting out their spare bedrooms or accommodations in Airbnb. So it's less troublesome in that regard. 
Likewise, we've got organizations such as Amazon Mechanical Turk and Fiverr, where essentially customers can request a variety of tasks to be completed. And uh, these might include anything from coding to transcription to translation. OK, so quite simple and sometimes ranging more towards the highly uh, skilled end of things. Uh, and essentially, workers on these platforms can operate remotely from anywhere in the world to complete tasks for clients anywhere in the world also. So again, quite difficult to, to regulate in that sense. And then the, the final component, and I suppose the, the key part of the gig economy from, from a, a work and employment perspective, and particularly from a HR perspective, focuses on organizations such as Uber, Deliveroo, Just Eat, and the real giants of the gig economy world, where essentially we're looking at workers who are operating in local markets. They're still um, using the online platforms and they're working from their smartphones and everything else, but they're operating in our local communities, our towns and cities, and they're very visible to us as a result. And because of that, uh, when we're talking about decent work and employment related issues in the gig economy, we are primarily uh, focused and concerned with issues that arise in this app based type of gig work. So one of the key questions then that always gets asked, and it's a very uh, logical question is like, how exactly do these gig workers differ from our, our understanding of what a regular or a traditional employee is? OK, and there are a few points here. But the first one is, is perhaps the most important, and it's very simply that gig workers are not actually classified legally as employees. So because of this, then um, they're classified as self-employed independent contractors. And because of this, they lack the protections and the benefits that would accompany conventional traditional employment. So everything from holiday pay to sick leave to protection against unfair dismissal. Instead, then, the type of arrangement that gig workers find themselves themselves in is quite complex and it's a digitized multi-party working relationship so we've got the gig worker the platform organization the customer and then also in food delivery platforms like Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Just Eat and so on we've also got the involvement of, a, of a, an additional party as a supplier uh, which would essentially refer to the restaurants who, who partner with Deliveroo for example to provide their services on the platform so from the workers perspective you're serving multiple agents in the working arrangements and there are some, some significant issues there in terms of uh, where the power imbalances lie and, and how great these power imbalances are. And finally, then, I guess tied to all of this is this notion and this narrative around the gig economy that essentially if you're a gig worker, you get to be your own boss. OK, but what exactly does that mean? And when we look at some of the promotional material around work in the gig economy, and particularly the recruitment strategies utilized by gig economy organizations, we see a really interesting perspective on, on how this work is promoted and, and pitched to potential workers. So, for example, you see billboards such as uh, saying things such as there's nothing like a safe, reliable paycheck to crush your soul. And likewise, the one from Lyft here, which operates in a similar way to Uber, uh, it says become a Lyft driver and it crosses out the idea of a nine to five job. So it's essentially promoting this idea of uh, escapism from the traditional confines of a workplace and a move towards increased flexibility. Likewise, then with Uber here on the bottom of the screen, we also see a similar narrative, uh, turn your, your car into a money machine, drive when you want, no office, no boss. And similar again with Deliveroo in terms of promoting flexibility and, uh, and autonomy in your working arrangements. And the reality is, I suppose, if, if, if this was uh, true and if this was the, the actuality of what work and the gig economy involved, then we would not necessarily be having this discussion today or there would not be uh, such intense debate around what work in the gig economy is and, and why it's problematic because fine we'd say these workers uh, don't have the traditional protections and benefits that accompany conventional employment but on the other hand they're not conventional employees they're completely autonomous they are self-employed they operate in their own schedule and they pick and choose tasks as they as they please okay and that comes back to the idea of what ubers say here no office no boss OK, but unfortunately, it's not actually that simple in the gig economy. And, and there's a wide body of literature and, and an increasing debate around the role of algorithmic management in the gig economy. So when we're talking about algorithmic management, what we're referring to is the automation of management practices by gig organizations uh, with the goal of coordinating a large and often very invisible and geographically dispersed workforce. OK, so just to give you an idea of the size and scope of the gig economy, because we, we might not realize the, the, the sheer volume of workers on these platforms. So Uber is the world's leading gig organization, has in excess of 4 million drivers across 700 cities. 
Similarly, with Lyft, there are over 2 million drivers across 600 cities. And with Deliveroo, we've got in excess of 35,000 workers across 200 cities. And in the Irish market alone, I think we have just in excess now of 1,500 uh, delivery riders across our Irish cities. Okay, so from the organizational perspective, uh, employing and implementing human management practices to coordinate this workforce would be a hugely arduous and also really, really expensive uh, and complex task. So instead, what we see then is the use of technology uh, enabled algorithms to underpin the execution of tasks on platforms by managing, monitoring and controlling gig workers activities. And this is why gig work, generally speaking, is so controversial because the situation emerges where platform organizations avoid giving direct commands to workers because that would signal a legal employment relationship. But at the same time, they very often tightly control many aspects of the labor process, and they also uh, are known to punish or, or, um, or restrict workers who fail to meet the very strict performance criteria implemented on platforms. And to give you an example of this from my own research, which looks at the, the lived experiences of gig workers across both the food delivery and the ride share or transportation sector. And this uh, particular food delivery worker says, you're left not knowing why the app was behaving in a certain way or telling you to do certain things, and then really interestingly, you're trying to tailor your behavior to the app all the time. Likewise, this uh, rideshare worker says they've made it so that you can't engage with them at all. Everything is automated and there's no personal touch or real representation. Another food delivery worker in terms of the punishments that can be issued says that if you reject orders, you'll be algorithmically demoted. So that means you get less orders and won't be able to pick the hours you want to work next week. So there's an, a limitation on your flexibility and your autonomy if you don't perform uh, to the level required. And finally, a bit of a more extreme example here from a rideshare worker was that a passenger once left me a one, a one star review because they thought the fare, which I don't decide, was too expensive. And I got removed from the platform for almost four weeks after that while it was investigated and eventually reinstated. But this rider lost out, or this worker rather, lost out in four weeks of work because of that. So again, this is just some simple examples to really emphasize the all-encompassing and, and very comprehensive and, and, and crucial role of algorithmic management uh, in coordinating and controlling gig workers' activities. So with that in mind, then, we're, we're left asking the question, is gig work decent work? Okay, and we return to our understanding and conceptualizations of what decent work is, and particularly in the context of job quality and advancing job quality. And there are four key aspects that we look at here. So decent work should provide jobs with development potential. There should be legal protection of employee rights. There should be opportunities for social dialogue. And there should also be work that is safe, healthy, fairly compensated, and promotes a work-life balance. Okay, so if we're to perhaps uh, very unscientifically and simplistically uh, apply these four points based on what we've just learned about the gig economy, we would probably be more inclined to say that gig work does not really equal decent work, at least not in, in all of the ways described on the screen here. Okay. However, we can take a closer look at this and particularly in the context of the opportunities and the challenges presented by gig work, both for platform organizations and also for gig workers. And these are quite interesting to, to tease out. Okay. So the opportunities from the perspective of organizations are quite obvious in that it's lowering employment costs because there is very little actual employment. And it's also quite a strategic business model where all the risks associated with the work are outsourced to workers. So if there's no demand in the market and there's no work available at that time, platforms aren't losing money because workers are only paid on a task by task basis rather than being paid an hourly wage or salary. Okay. And the opportunities for gig workers then uh, look at issues that we've spoken about already around enhanced flexibility and autonomy around certain aspects of the work. Also the opportunity to diversify your income streams and this idea of micro entrepreneurship where you are a self-employed independent contractor under the umbrella of this organization. Okay. Also really interestingly then are the challenges. Again, from platform organizations perspective, the really key one here is that the really typically poor level of engagement that exists between the platform organization and the worker simply because there is no human manager to engage with. Okay, and because of this, what we have seen across many gig organizations is an extremely high turnover rate and, and very poor retention levels. And this then combined with the ongoing negative publicity that tends to surround the gig economy and particular organizations within the gig economy, uh, it, it raises questions around the long-term sustainability of the business model being used in the gig economy.
okay and for gig workers the challenges here are quite obvious around very long working hours minimal social protection and just generally speaking a very insecure working arrangement okay so as we head towards the end of, uh, of my talk with you guys today, I want to have a, a chat with you about a, a recent example of driving change in the gig economy and using the example of California's gig economy. Okay, so some of you might be familiar with this. And in September of 2019, so just over a year ago, Assembly Bill 5, uh, known as AB5, was passed in California, the state of California. And what this did then was uh, seek to reclassify millions of gig workers as employees. Okay, so a huge win for workers it would entitle them to greater labor protections around minimum wage sick leave compensation benefits and so on and as you can imagine there was quite a significantly heavy pushback on this from gig organizations and some of the impacts of ab5 that we saw in that short amount of time would have been uh, the, the requirement for ride share platforms to allow workers to see their end destinations of individual journeys or tasks in advance of accepting them uh, the removal of penalties for rejecting tasks and also a really interesting one was allowing workers more control over setting the rates that were charged to customers. Okay, so essentially what we were seeing here, if we were to summarize, is the retirements or at least the reduction in power of the algorithmic management function. Okay, so a win for gig workers. Okay, but there's another twist in this tale, and this was just last month, okay, in November of this year, with the proposal of Proposition 22. And what this ballot sought to do was to exempt gig organizations from having to classify their workers as employees. So it was essentially the, the gig economy's response to AB5 and gig organizations fighting back against this by claiming that AB5 would essentially destroy the gig economy. It would make them less profitable. It would increase costs both for organizations and also for customers. And in ways it would eradicate workers' flexibility too. Okay, so as you can imagine, this received quite significant pushback from the vast majority of gig workers who were very much against uh, Proposition 22 coming into effect. Uh, however, what we saw then, and, and it, it was uh, less of an issue, I guess, in the context of the US election, because the vote wasn't the same day, but it, it was still quite widely publicized on social media in terms of the power and the influence of gig organizations in that funding the Yes on Proposition 22 campaign. So gig organizations in California grouped together and collectively spent in excess of 200 million US dollars on the Yes on 22 campaign. And this was really intensive. So as you can see from the picture on the top of the screen here, anytime a customer or indeed a driver opened the Uber app, they would be faced with this notification about Proposition 22 and voting yes on this. And your only options to dismiss this notification were to say yes on Prop 22 or OK. OK, so there was no opportunity to open a dialogue here or to challenge the merits of Proposition 22. And likewise, this one uh, went somewhat viral on social media because of the uh, the, the I don't know ethical issues or, or maybe some of the irony in it also where restaurants that partnered with food delivery platforms were provided with uh, food delivery bags that were promoting uh, the yes on 22 campaign okay so food delivery workers then whether or not they agreed with proposition 22 had little choice but to uh, use these bags to deliver food to customers and indirectly promoting the platform's interests as a result okay and even though these tactics were controversial, ultimately what happened last month is that Proposition 22 was passed in California and it has provided an exemption to gig organizations for classifying workers as employees and building on what was a really huge and significant success for the gig economy model, uh, Uber in particular has since outlined its plans to push for similar legislation at a national level. So it raises some issues for us there in terms of uh, when and at this stage, if will we ever see the achievement of decent work in the gig economy. Okay, so I wanted to briefly touch on uh, this year as well, because the gig economy has, has really been in focus this year in the context of the pandemic, okay, where many gig workers were deemed essential and is providing essential services in markets. And in the Irish context, this was just as prevalent as everywhere else in the world, where we saw a 50% increase in orders on food delivery platforms, and really interestingly, an 80% increase in applications to become a worker on these platforms. Likewise, some of the gig organizations uh, launched various initiatives here to support workers. So Just Eat had a 14-day career relief payment, which was essentially like uh, providing sick pay. So for, for workers who, who got ill or had to self-isolate for two weeks. And likewise, Deliveroo would reimburse their workers uh, up to the value of 20 euro for the purchase of PPE gear also. Uber then on a, on a grander scale around the world also offered uh, free trips and free deliveries of food and, and equipment to frontline workers, to seniors and to people in need. 
And despite all of these efforts by gig organizations to be good national and also good global citizens in the context of, of the world of work, what it really did do was put a spotlight on the uncertain and precarious conditions that are faced by gig workers, uh, particularly this year, it, it operating throughout a, a global pandemic, but also prior to this, that the conditions were the same. And, and at this point in time, they don't show any great signs of changing beyond that. OK, but there has been increasing focus, particularly by media organizations, on the activities of gig organizations and on the need for platforms to enact a duty of care to their partner workers. So what's next for the gig economy then? And I won't dwell on this too much because we don't really know, I suppose, definitively. But what we are seeing is relatively slow but steady growth. And, and to touch on something that uh, Professor Dave Conning spoke about on Monday uh, or, or Tuesday of this week, in terms of how gig working arrangements are creeping into more conventional employment practices also, and that's aligned with the increasing demand for flexibility in the future of work, which is populated or will be populated increasingly by millennials and Generation Z who bring different demographic needs into the workforce. And one prediction is that by 2027, freelancers will make up to 60% of the workforce. Okay, so will that happen? Who knows, but th those are the trends that we're looking at right now. Okay, however, the issues still remain with the gig economy specifically, and, and I suppose the key issue here is that the stakeholders involved haven't yet seemed to crack the code in terms of creating a gig economy that works for everyone, that is fair, that provides decent work for all, and that also can work for organizations by allowing them to prosper and to be profitable. Okay, so how do you balance all of the needs and requirements in this domain? Again, we don't really know at this point. But I did want to end on a slightly more optimistic note in terms of some of the more recent initiatives that have been enacted or, or implemented by gig organizations around decent work in particular. And one example here is the Deliveroo Rider Academy, which uh, sees Deliveroo partner with external training agencies to provide maybe discounted rates on upskilling courses for workers. So it's quite an interesting one around the provision of training. Again, outsourced, but still the provision of training. Likewise, Uber last year uh, expanded its market into this new platform called Uber Works. And essentially, this provides uh, users on the Uber platform with the opportunity to engage in uh, temporary working arrangements with other organizations beyond Uber uh, through the provision of the app. So the app, again, uh, creates the relationship. And an interesting one here to end with then is from Lyft. So Lyft uh, earlier this year, really interesting, interestingly, paid for billboards and then wrote letters to their drivers, thanking them. And what was interesting about this was that it, it typically um, was, you know, quite warmly worded and everything else, but it was at the same time uh, removing itself from any employment responsibility or relationship with workers by acknowledging that they're aspiring architects, caretakers, whatever it might be, and not just a, a Lyft driver. Okay, so it says no matter what you're driving toward, we're, we'll help get you there. Okay, so whether or not gig organizations and the gig economy overall can build on this towards the creation and development of sustainable work in the future. We don't know, uh, but we do certainly hope so. And, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing what the future holds in this area. So that is my presentation. And thank you all so much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting. And again, uh, when we have a Q&A session uh, now or at the end of, of the session, I'd love to hear your thoughts and insights on the topic. Thank you. Thanks so much, James. I'm glad you ended on an optimistic note because it is very pessimistic otherwise uh, to think about the, the, the conditions of gig workers worldwide. Um, if anybody does have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. Um, James, I'm going to ask you about health and safety, and I think you did touch on it. Um, we had a very sad case in Ireland and Dublin uh, this year um, where Deliveroo uh, driver lost his life or had his life taken away from him. Um, who protects them? If, for example, you are a delivery worker on a bike and, you know, you, you have an accident with a car, who protects a worker like that? Mm. Well, the short answer, I guess, is, is, is no one in, in that gig workers themselves, for the most part. And again, the, the, the specific terms vary across organizations. But broadly speaking, in the gig economy, all the risks of employment and, and even in the context of health and safety are entirely on the workers. And obviously that, you know, the, the tragic case in, in Dublin really brought that into light in the Irish context. But I, I know from conducting this research, speaking to many workers who have had accidents, um, you know, been, been hit by cars or fallen off their bikes or whatever the case might be. And the platform 
by its very nature, uh, in terms of denying any employment responsibility to the workers, essentially wishes you well and says like, you know, come back to us whenever you're ready and, you know, the platform will be here to uh, offer you work once again. But there is nothing in the line of, um, of a, an insurance scheme or anything else. Now, Deliveroo in particular across Europe uh, has in the last, I think, two years uh, implemented an optional uh, worker insurance policy where workers can pay an additional fee every month. Um, and, and be covered by an external um, insurance policy if they are injured in the role or whatever it is. But again, it's bearing in mind that these workers, you know, as a rule are poorly paid. Um, it's low skill work and it's high risk work. So the, 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 um, the requirements on them then to pay externally for, for insurance coverage to, to, to mitigate against any of these risks is something that generally speaking hasn't had a significant uptake um, in, in the gig economy overall. Okay, and uh, thanks for that, James. Uh, I have another question here. Uh, what is your opinion on the limitations or risks that come with the gig economy for freelancers? Do you think some of them are fair? You know, for example, being demoted for rejecting orders. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. And I, someone said to me early on in the PhD that, um, you know, when you're interviewing gig workers and, and in this domain, you have to balance the line between science and activism because when you hear some of the stories and and the horror stories as, as one worker described them you are, you do get quite invested in it and everything else uh but i mean even at an objective level you know i, I think you have to recognize from as a hr researcher the um the issues that exist in terms of algorithmically demoting or, or deactivating a worker and of course in, in any job it's, it's understood that you have to meet minimum performance standards and that you know you are susceptible to being fired or, or punished or whatever the case is but the real issue here is that you know platforms deny any type of employment responsibility towards workers yet they still want to implement this type of control and monitoring over the work workforce so as a result it, it, it kind of seems like gig organizations are having the best of both worlds while workers are always coming out the worst end which doesn't really add up in terms of how they're classified. So is it fair? Possibly not, uh, but is it how it's done? Unfortunately, uh, on a wide scale level, then, then yes. And again, just, just building on that point in terms of, of, of uh, relaying maybe some of the information from workers, it really depends and, and, and the happiness and the satisfaction of workers that I've spoken to really depends on, on their motivations for getting involved in the gig economy in the first place. So it is important to highlight that a lot of food delivery workers in particular in Ireland um, are, are students just working a few hours a week uh, in a pre-COVID world to, to fund their, their night out or their weekend or whatever it was. And they were happy enough with the conditions, you know, they weren't that engaged with the platform. But the issues that, that really arise here then are for those who are actually reliant and dependent on the work. And that presents a, a whole separate uh, range of, of questions and issues and debates. Thanks, James. We've lots of questions coming in. A uh, question from Tom. Uh, on the gig economy, are there examples in Ireland of it working well for the gig workers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I suppose I, I almost preempted Tom's question there without seeing it. Um, so again, Tom, yeah, having spoken to a huge amount of, of student workers and perhaps migrant workers as well in the Irish context and also the UK context uh, in the food delivery sector, this is the gig economy does, of course, provide easy access to labour market opportunities, uh, relatively speedy income. So it, it, it's very easy to be, be recruited onto a gig economy platform you meet minimum criteria and you're recruited. There's no formal recruitment process of being interviewed and everything else. So for workers who, who crave and desire that, then of, of course it provides this really great opportunity. But I think the risk then, and even for these workers is what happens in the longer term where you're, you're, you don't have any developmental opportunities, you don't have formal upskilling opportunities, and you perhaps run the risk of becoming trapped in this cycle of precarious, precarity and um, instability. Thanks, James. Uh, a question from somebody we both know from year in Myrink uh, and very well, <laughs> very warm hey, welcome uh, joining us from the University of Twente in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, Jurin wants to know in your research, did you come across instances where requesters, for example, restaurants do not ensure decent working conditions for gig workers? Yeah, well, hi, Jurin, first of all, and, and, and uh, nice to virtually see you. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't really look at it from the perspective of, of partner restaurants, but by association, we, we did learn a few things in that way as well, in terms of, 
maybe uh, workers uh, collectivizing very informally to blacklist restaurants on platforms, perhaps because restaurants are known to have really long waiting times, which are unpaid from the worker's perspective, or also maybe, um, you know, they, they shout at workers if they come in, they don't want them hanging around the shop, so they ask them to wait outside in the rain. And then workers via their, their WhatsApp groups or their social media or whatever, spread this story around the city uh, to their fellow workers. And all of a sudden, no orders will be accepted from that restaurant for a period of time. So it's it's an interesting one. And, and, and certainly, it's uh, I think it's a really interesting avenue for, for future research to, to look at all of the parties in the working arrangement and figure out where the power imbalances lie. And again, we're quite unsure. And it seems to vary across platforms in terms of the input that restaurants can have in rating workers. They, they can report via the um, device in their store that they receive orders from if they've had a negative experience with the worker. But the feedback mechanisms here are quite generic in terms of everything was fine. There was an issue. You know, th th there's not an awful lot of uh, qualitative depth to, to the feedback. Thanks, James. Um, a question from Anthony. Is there a thinking that the employment legislation needs to be updated in some way uh, to give some protection to gig workers? Of course, who offers the protection? Is it governments? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it, it, it's I think when I, when I started researching this first back in 2017, pretty much the only literature available in the area was around, uh, the, you know, legislation and the legal architectures and how they can be updated. And, you know, I've, I've read so much on it since. And unfortunately, uh, disregarding maybe individual cases across different regions or cities that are tribunal based and not a white, a white scale decision, the decisions um are quite unclear in terms of favoring gig organizations versus favoring gig workers. And of course, there is a need for a policy solution here and a legislative solution. But again, as I mentioned, one of the slides, it seems like none of the stakeholders have yet cracked the code um, in terms of, of balancing the line between an independent contractor and an employee. Is, is there somewhere in between that, that you can have the best of both while still benefiting the organization? Or, um, or, or, or can that even be achieved? It, it remains to be seen. Thanks, James. A question from Oshin now. Uh, having done some freelance work or gig work in the journalism sector, I often found it to be a power struggle between myself and the organisation. Do you feel the scope of your discussion today moves into that industry too? Uh, I know the algorithm, uh, algorithmic uh, yeah. algorithm may not. But yeah, really good question, Oshin. Yeah, and I think it's a complicated one because when we're looking at the gig economy, uh, as I mentioned at the start, there are so many definitions of what the gig economy is, and some people don't uh, define it as being exclusively online in terms of online platforms. And it can be freelance um, tutors, teachers, uh, journalists, whatever it might be, and then you are part of the gig economy. So certainly it does bridge into that discussion um, in terms of particularly in terms of legislation, in terms of ensuring, you know, decent work and, and fair, fairly compensated work for everyone. Um, and I suppose then what, what's really specific to online gig work and the online gig economy is the role of, of technology and these algorithmic technologies in, in coordinating and, and, and electronically monitoring these workers and the implications of that. Uh, so I, I'm not sure of, of, of Oshin's particular experiences with the power struggle, but I can imagine that even as a freelance self-employed worker, there is at this point in time in the labor market always an element of precarity there unless you're in an extremely highly skilled sector um so, so certainly yeah, there's a fine line between all of these issues for sure yeah, and then james another question do you think the challenges mentioned in your work could be alleviated by a kind of restricted universal basic income for example in ireland people on social welfare doing a gig are punished by having to have to pay the Department of Social Protection. So do you think this could retain the current flexibility for both employers and workers without changing the status like in California? What do you think? Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting perspective that I hadn't really considered before. Um, and again, one of the interesting things about the, the practices, the management practices on these platforms is that, um, you know, my research was conducted across five different geographical regions so there are workers from all over the world here and they all have broadly speaking the exact same experiences whether they're in a tightly regulated co economy or a very loosely regulated economy so the, the platforms are operating in a, a world of their own essentially in terms of the, the policies and and uh, the employment or, or the working practices that they enforce or implement on workers 
Um, so yeah, whether whether that then needs to occur in, in every individual region and it needs to be regulated individually, or if platforms as a whole need to regulate their operations. Um, again, I, I don't really have the answer to, to that one or the solution. I wish I did, um, but it, it's a very complex one. And, and certainly there's, there's probably no one size fits all here because you don't want to take away the flexibility from workers and the freedom to work whenever they want. But also for those workers who are dependent on the work, you want to ensure that they can get what they need out of it too. And James, just another question, which moves slightly beyond uh, gig workers. Um, there's recent mm. research that says that you know um, larger firms would have on average nine different apps that they're using to manage their workers. Um, to what extent are these types of controlling performance, you know, hard performance management practices going to soon apply to all workers where we're being tracked and monitored and punished mm. maybe um, given whatever ratings or whatever there is in those apps? Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's an interesting one and it, it links back, I think, to, to Dave's talk earlier this week around, you know, gig work in, in more traditional sectors and highly skilled employment, because we are in this context of, of my research talking about very low skill, poorly paid, you know, peripheral work anyway. But moving forward, I mean, I, I think if you asked me a year ago, I would have said, look, maybe in 10 years from now, we'll be talking about uh, remote working and, and electronic performance measurement and monitoring. But we've arrived there much faster than, than I think what any of us anticipated. Uh, whether or not that, that acceleration will stall again in 2021 or 2022 uh, remains to be seen, or, or are we really heading towards uh, you know, a workplace that will be very quickly driven by AI in terms of, of, of monitoring the entire labor process from recruitment to performance measurements to uh, the generation of, of, you know, in, insane amounts of, of, of data analytics on, on worker performance and engagement and, and everything else. And while, while that's scary to some extent, of course, it holds the promise of, you know, a more engaged workforce and maybe a more fulfilled workforce. But also, uh, you know, we can't lose the, the human and human resources in terms of uh, the softer management skills and the engagement that that organizations uh, typically have had and have have had great success in having with with workers. So there, there's a fine line to balance there again. And um, certainly with the, the automation of more um, repetitive tasks, fair enough. Beyond that, it's it, it's a slippery slope, I think. But it also raises questions about the future of management as well. If there is going to be a lot more apps, then you know where do the managers go, or who do, you know, uh, you know, could exactly. see displacement of them as well. James, I want to 100%. thank you sincerely for a really interesting talk. Uh, it was really nice, and I thought your slides were really nicely put together too. Um, oh, thank well you. Well done, and best of luck, obviously, with the very. I know you're in the very last stages of your research, so good luck uh, with that as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks, James. Uh, so everyone, I want to introduce you now to Dr. Neave Humphreys, uh, who's a reader with the RCPI um, in, the, in the Human Resource Research Centre in, uh, no, the Health Systems Research Centre in uh, RCPI. Uh, and Neve is doing really, really interesting work um, on a project that is funded by the Health Research Board. And it's looking at the quality or lack of quality, maybe, um, that our junior doctors are facing. Um, in Ireland and, and what that means for our health service. Thanks, Neve. Thanks a million, Adele, and thanks a million, James, for a fantastic presentation. It's really interesting to see another group of essential frontline workers or who have, have become essential frontline workers during the pandemic and how they've got on. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, so my presentation is on something completely different. It's on hospital doctors in Ireland, but also how that relates to the Sustainable Development Goal 8. Um, yeah. Sorry, this isn't, sorry, one second. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, great stuff. So the research that I'm gonna to present today is draws on the Hospital Doctor Retention and Motivation Project, which is a HRB funded project that's been running for the last few years in uh, the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland. Um, I have a picture here of my wonderful team, um, myself, Jennifer Creese and John Paul Byrne, who have all been working away on the project for the last few years. And the cartoon is a picture of us um, attempting to continue our research during the COVID pandemic, which has been no easy task. Um, I'd also like to mention and thank all of the wonderful co-applicants on, on the HDRM project, including two from DCU, um, 
Professor Dal Conway and Professor Anne Matthews. Sorry. Sorry, the... there you go. Fantastic. So the first point I'd like to make in relation to um, hospital doctors um, is, is that it has taken a pandemic really for us to see the extent to which our lives and our livelihoods depend on, on timely access to healthcare. The, during the pandemic, we've seen health workers treating COVID and non-COVID patients in hospitals and in the community, conducting COVID testing and conducting COVID contact tracing, and also leading the public health response to COVID-19. And I think what we've seen during the pandemic is how important health workers are um, to our lives in a way that perhaps we had taken for granted before the pandemic. So if I have, um, if I feel symptoms of COVID-19 today um, and I need to organize a, a COVID test, I need to contact my GP. I need to, the GP needs to contact the HSC and arrange a, a COVID test for me. Um, and I need to wait until I can get a COVID, a result on that COVID test before I can move, before I can leave the house. And importantly, before my um, my household, um, anybody else in my family can leave the house too. So I think the pandemic has really shown us how um, important the health workforce is in enabling our timely access to healthcare. And during the pandemic, um, timely access to healthcare is, is, is everything. Because without that COVID negative um, result, um, we, we can't continue with our daily lives. So really our access to healthcare and our timely access to healthcare depends on having the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time to deliver that care. And I think that's just really important to bear in mind as, as we go through the presentation. A colleague of mine, sorry, it's jumped there. A colleague of mine has explained it really well um, in relation to the COVID pandemic. So countries under lockdown discovered healthcare workers as their new heroes. And although this is a welcome sign of appreciation of frontline healthcare staff, it's neither sufficient nor sustainable. We don't need heroes who pay with their health and well-being, even with their life. What we need the most are healthcare systems that take care of the health and the well-being of their staff and pay them in a fair and gender equitable manner. And I think this is where Sustainable Development Goal 3 links with Sustainable Development Goal 8. Um, and it's, it was really interesting when Adele invited me to take part in this um, presentation today, because I always think of my research in relation to Sustainable Development Goal 3, good health and well-being, rather than in relation to Sustainable Development Goal 8. But actually, both um, are, are really important, and the pandemic has shown that. Um, in order to protect our health and well-being, we need access to healthcare. And our access to healthcare depends on the health workforce. And they themselves need decent working conditions to protect their own health and well-being while at work. So I think these two uh, sustainable de development goals, three and eight, are really critical and really important to bear in mind as, as we go through some of the findings from the HGRM project. So today I'm going to draw on data from the HGRM project. So the project's been running for a couple of years now, and I'm going to draw on data from three different work packages. Um, and I'm going to use this data to illustrate how hospital doctors in Ireland struggle to access decent working conditions. Um, so the first data set I'm going to draw on um, are qualitative interviews with Irish trained doctors in Australia that I conducted in 2018. Um, the next data set is a survey of hospital doctors in Ireland that I conducted this time last year um, in late 2019. And finally, um, some qualitative interviews that we've done this year during the pandemic. Um, obviously, we did these interviews virtually. We did them by Zoom or by phone. Um, and we spoke to hospital doctors who had worked through the first, the first wave of the pandemic. So had worked um, between March and, and May in the Irish health system. So medicine, I suppose it's the other end of the scale from the gig economy in that medicine is, is, is a high status, high skill occupation that has traditionally provided access to really high quality jobs and relatively high salaries as well. But I think what comes with that is the presumption that medicine provides good jobs um, for all and that it is always decent work that is provided. Um, but I think um, Ireland has a very high rate of doctor emigration um, it has high turnover, which would indicate that they're, you know, that these jobs aren't perfect, that they're not necessarily as 
as as as good or um, as we might um, presume that they are. So Ireland's high rate of emigration would indicate a dissatisfaction with some of the at least some of the terms and conditions on offer to hospital doctors in the Irish health system. So the high rate of doctor em of doctor emigration, um, Australia has really emerged since 2008 as a really key destination for Irish trained doctors, um, but it's not the only destination. So the more traditional destinations that Irish trained doctors would have emigrated to would have been the UK and the US. Um, and our doctors still emigrate there as well as to New Zealand and Canada. So I'll just show you how many Irish trained doctors emigrate to Aust Australia in a given year. Um, so in and around the recession, 2008, 2009, um, 153 Irish doctors obtained work visas to work in Australia. And that has increased up to in around 300 in, in, in recent years, which is really high. So if we just track back for a second we're to, to, to the number of, of doctors that Ireland trains every year, Ireland trains 700 Irish or EU medical students each year. So that's how many are entering the workforce for the first time. And yet 300 or so doctors each year are also emigrating to Australia. And that is only one of several destinations that, that Irish trained doctors emigrate to. So I suppose after the recession, there was a general um, wave of emigration from Ireland to Australia in recognition that the economic conditions here were, were, were um, not great and the economic conditions in Australia were much better. Um, but that wave of emigration from Ireland to Australia um, began to slow around 2013, 2014. But we can see from this graph is that the number of doctors migrating to Australia has continued on an upward trend. Um, so it has continued to increase, um, which kind of illustrates that it's, it's not economic conditions that are driving the immigration of Irish trained doctors to move from Ireland to Australia. Um, and the research that I've done will show that it's, it's, it is much more about the working conditions and the comparative working conditions in Ireland compared to Australia. So in 2018, um, I traveled to Australia and I conducted qualitative interviews with Irish trained doctors who had moved to Australia in the decade or so um, before then, so between 2008 and 2018. And I found that working conditions were a key reason for them to move to Australia. Um, they felt that the working conditions in the Irish health system had been getting worse, particularly since the recession, and that these auster austerity related cutbacks had meant that their jobs had deteriorated, the job quality had deteriorated and their jobs had begun to resemble extreme jobs more and more. And this was a key driver of their emigration um, to Australia. Um, so long working hours are a key feature of extreme jobs, as this respondent explains. When I was an intern, I worked 100 hour weeks as standard. The administrator would pay maybe 83 of the hours that week. So these interns are, are very early career doctors. They've just finished, it's their first year after um, their primary medical qualification. So in their first year of working as a hospital doctor um, in medicine, um, they are working, this doctor was explaining how they're working 100 hour weeks, which is you know, very, very high um, in terms of the number of working hours. And the reason for only being paid or not being paid fully for the hours that, that they worked um, relates to the European Working Time Directive and the hospitals or the employers' um, eagerness to um, show compliance with the European Working Time Directive, which would mean that rather than ensure their workers aren't working um, above and beyond the European Working Time Directive mandated hours, um, they would just perhaps not pay the workers for the full amount of um, hours that they had worked in the, in the Irish health system. Um, another aspect of extreme jobs is doing more with less. Um, and this was very, um, very apparent to hospital doctors during um, the economic recession, um, where there were fewer staff in the system, fewer resources in the Irish health system. Um, and as a result, those workers who were in the system felt that they were working harder and harder and doing more with less, as this, as this doctor explains. I felt like I spent my whole day putting out fires. I didn't ever get on top of the workload. The system didn't work. I felt continually stressed. Another aspect of an extreme job is always fighting a climate of negativity. 
the bigger the hospital, the angrier people were. A lot of aggression, a lot of fighting, just because everyone is exhausted and burnt out. So the extreme jobs and, and the deterioration in the working conditions in the Irish health system was a real driver of doctor emigration from Ireland and um, was a real cause of kind of n negative feeling and, and kind of um, poor workplace morale in the Irish health system. Um, faced with these kind of deteriorating working conditions, the doctors that I spoke to, obviously these were doctors who had already moved to Australia, had, had moved, um, moved to Australia in order to resolve the issue of, of, of poor working conditions. So they came up with an individual solution to this kind of system-wide um, deterioration in, in, in working conditions. Um, emigration provided a, a very um, quick and easy solution um, in that they would access better working conditions working as a hospital doctor in the Australian health system than were available to them in the Irish health system. Um, and I think what these interviews showed was really the extent to which the working conditions in the Irish health system were causing a lot of unhappiness um, in, in the lives of these individual doctors. Um, but because these doctors, when I presented this research um, after um, 2018, um, the feedback that I got was really that these were emigrant doctors and perhaps they had had experiences of the of the of the Irish health system that were out of date or that had things had changed since they had left the system and perhaps had improved. So to kind of um, see if this was true, we conducted a survey late last year, so this time last year, of hospital doctors in Ireland to see how the experiences of those in Australia compared with those who were currently working in the Irish health system. Had things changed in, in the decade or so, or had they um, remained the same? So what we found from the survey was a, a similar level of strain um, among, among the hospital doctors currently working in the Irish health system. 73% um, of them agreed or strongly agreed that they often felt the strain of attempting to balance their responsibilities at home and at work. So their feedback was kind of uh, very similar to, to the interviews given by the Irish trained doctors in Australia. Um, so we analysed the qualitative data um, generated by free text responses to that survey. And this provided huge insight into the experience of work-life imbalance and the impact that this was having on individual doctors and on, on, on their well-being in, in the Irish health system. I feel tired and burnt out by the time I get home to see my wife and children. I don't feel that I'm being a good father at the moment. So really their experiences of, of work in the Irish health system were very similar to those experiences outlined by the Irish trained doctors in Australia in that it was uh, hospital medicine seems to be a job that, that absorbs an awful lot of their time and energy and leaves them with very little else, um, leaves them with very little. And um, so going home, very little time or energy left to spend with your family, very little, um, yeah, very little um, ability to achieve a balance between work life and home life. And um, the next quote illustrates how that really even extends to self care and, and their own personal well being. I find I cannot justify taking time off work to attend routine GP appointments. And I'm often in work so late and on the weekends that I can't even get my prescriptions for antidepressants filled. So I think this really relates to sustainable development goal three and eight, where we find um, hospital doctors who simply cannot find time for self-care because of the conditions of their work. Um, and I think it, it often strikes me how different hospital medicine is from, from many other jobs and, and, and what we perhaps take for granted in other jobs in terms of being able to take time off when sick or being able to time, take time off um, for, for GP, regular GP appointments. So I think in the data that I've presented so far, you really see how hospital doctors in Ireland are struggling to balance um, their work and their lives. And they're also working very long hours, which leaves them with very little time for themselves and um, very little time to to um, to self care, to mind their own well-being and to mind their families and, and, and those who depend on them outside of work. And I think 
as we were analyzing this data early on in the pandemic, um, the pandemic came along and we were working from home and um, working on papers which analyze this survey data. And we were wondering what, what um, sort of state the, the health system would be now that it was already under strain and then had it had a COVID pandemic added to it. And we were really um, interested in finding out how the hospital doctors had uh, responded to this additional workload, this, this additional um, strain of the pandemic on top of everything else. So that kind of motivated us um, in June, July of this year, we um, modified our plans for 2020 as everybody did in terms of, of what research was possible during a pandemic. And we decided to conduct qualitative interviews with hospital doctors who had worked through the first phase of, of, of the pandemic. So the first wave. Um, and we, because of the pandemic, we conducted all of these in interviews virtually and by Zoom or by phone. And um, we also, um, we accessed uh, hospital doctors via Twitter and via social media and um, because our, our normal uh, routes into the profession weren't available to us given that we were all working from home. So because of the survey and because of our findings previously on the HDRM project, we were really expecting a lot of further deterioration um, from, from within our interviews um, during the COVID pandemic. But what we found instead was that surprisingly, the pandemic had improved um, working conditions for junior hospital doctors. Um, they felt that they were um, better staffed. Um, and this was partly because of, of, of kind of massive redeployments within the health system as in order to cope with the pandemic, um, a lot of routine care was, was closed down or temporarily paused to focus, so to focus the, the, the system really on, on dealing with COVID. Um, but the, the net effect of that on the hospital doctors, on the junior hospital doctors that we spoke to, was that they felt better supported at work during the pandemic um, than they might have on a regular, um, on a regular winter um, in the Irish health system. A huge difference for staff, for junior hospital staff, was that cover was provided for staff who were off sick or who had to isolate because of COVID-19. So healthcare workers obviously are at much greater risk of contracting um, COVID-19 due to the nature of their work. Um, and during COVID, there were strict protocols about um, staff who contracted um, COVID or who were close contacts of COVID having to take a certain number of days off and not allowed back into the workplace until um, they, they were better, basically. And that really isn't the norm for um, hospital doctors in the Irish healthcare system who often when they ring in sick um, to work are told to come in anyway or are asked to find their own cover and um, so that they, they, they don't really have um, find their own covers so they can't not turn up to work until they find somebody else to work that shift for them. So they actually found that during COVID this this um, availability of, of additional staff to cover them was great because it meant that they could take time to be sick. It meant that they didn't feel guilty about ringing in sick, that they knew it was for the benefit of them, them and for their patients and for their, their colleagues that they remain home if they were poorly or if they were at risk of having COVID. Um, the availability of more staff and, and, and the restructuring and redeployment of staff meant that doctors, hospital doctors that we spoke to had more manageable workloads during the first wave of the pandemic. And um, there were simply more staff around to share the workload. And this probably relates quite closely to the availability of cover um, for staff who were isolating or who were out sick. Um, they felt that there was more efficient decision making um, during the COVID first wave um, because there were more senior staff were more available um, and, and on the floor with them. So whereas previously in the, in the system, junior hospital doctors might have to wait um, a few hours or a few days to run something by a senior member of staff. During COVID, it was all hands on deck and, and it was much more easy for them to get the sign off from a senior, senior consultant, which would enable them to, to treat the patients faster and move things along faster. So some of the delays in the system disappeared um, during the first wave of COVID pandemic. And the result of all of this was um, better staff morale and better relationships at work, which was really interesting and something that we, we didn't um, expect to find from um, the interviews during a global pandemic. But what staff really felt or what the respondents really felt was that the system had been in an unacknowledged crisis long before COVID and that they often had uh, 
given they, they give examples from last winter or the winter before where um, the Irish health system was under significant strain, had a hugely overcrowded um, emergency departments, patients waiting on trolleys and um, doctors having to treat pe patients while on trolleys or while in chairs. So they felt that there, there had been a, a crisis in the health system basically annually every winter for the last few years, but that with the COVID pandemic came a, an acknowledgement of the crisis, um, which was welcomed. Um, although they felt that it shouldn't have taken a pandemic to improve and revol revolutionize the healthcare system. But they were um, very pleased to see, I suppose, acknowledgement from the public and from the government and from, from um, the, the HSC and the Department of Health that, that they were working within um, a, a crisis because that brought resources and brought a crisis response, which was long overdue. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting from the interviews that we undertook during the pandemic was the hope that um, the hospital doctors had that perhaps things in the Irish health system might improve. And I suppose, unfortunately, this is something that's often missing from the interviews that I do with hospital doctors. Um, they have um, experienced difficult working conditions, long working hours and um, things like that. But they also have very little hope that things will improve in the Irish health system. Whether they were in Australia or in Ireland, they would often just be quite negative about the possibility of improvement in the Irish health system. And that's, I think, one of the drivers of emigration. One of the reasons that they emigrate is that that's a, a surefire way of improving your working conditions is, is, is to emigrate rather than to um, stay in the Irish health system and, and hope for improvement. Um, but I suppose to counter that or, or to kind of temper that a little bit, um, there was a fear among respondents particularly towards the end of, of data collection in July, um, there was a fear of a return to normal in terms of working conditions in the Irish health system. There was a feeling that some of the additional resources some of the redeployments were being reversed. And there was a fear um, with among the hospital doctors that things might go back to the way they had been um, prior to the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and this cartoon that I, um, that I commissioned by Owen Kelleher is, is, is a really good way of, of, of showing that. Um, the hospital doctors really felt that, that we were at a crossroads in terms of working conditions and in terms of decent work for, for them within the Irish health system. And there was a choice. Um, we could either go back to being understaffed and, and with doctors working long hours and um, emigrating really to avoid the work, some of the working conditions in the Irish health system. But there was also an opportunity within COVID to maintain some of the COVID related changes that had actually improved things for, for hospital doctors, um, including quite basic things like cover for sick leave and proper staffing levels, because they felt that that would really improve their own working conditions and lead to better doctor retention um, in the Irish health system. So just to go back again to the, the sustainable development goals, I think that the research, the HDRM research has shown and continues to show that Irish hospital doctors emigrate in order to access better working conditions in other countries. And I think that that fact of emigration to achieve or to access decent work really must become a thing of the past, especially in the context of a global pandemic. I think that we really need to ensure that hospital doctors in Ireland have access to decent work in line with uh, Sustainable Development Goal 8, because we need to enable them to protect their health and well-being while they deliver health and, and health care that helps us to protect our health and well-being. And I think that's just really important both during and after the pandemic. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Neve, and hopefully you have ended on an optimistic note uh, as well uh, in relation to those findings. You could only hope that the situation will change for our junior doctors. Uh, I do have a good question, and anybody has any other questions for Neve, please, please pop them into the Q&A. Um, Anthony wants to know, it'd be interesting to compare, it's a good question, to do a comparison of the HSE versus uh, private hospital doctors. So were any respondents from the private system? <laughs> 
Yeah, um, it's it's complicated as always in, in, in the Irish health system because during the pandemic, the Irish government temporarily took over control of the private hospitals, you might remember, in order to have surge capacity. So particularly in terms of ICU beds and uh, single rooms. And the so there was a lot of, um, I suppose the private, they took over the hospitals and, and then the staff had the option to sign up um, to a new contract. And the private um, consultants, not all of them did um, sign up to that new contract. So I think when we were speaking to the private, the, the hospital doctors in the private hospitals, that was mostly what was the, the, the focus of the discussion um, was really that the takeover um, and, and that, that dynamic. So I think it, it's, it would be an interesting comparison for sure, but it's complicated by the, the contract situation and um, the kind of disagreements between the HSE and the um, private hospital doctors and then their employers who were the private hospitals. So it, it, it just, that was, um, it wasn't as straightforward as, as you might think, you know, in terms of a comparison, you know. I want to just pull out two of the findings um, or at least conversations that we have had about uh, your research because you do a lot of research in this area. Um, I remember you telling me that somebody got a phone call from the airport um, because their shift wasn't covered and they were about to go on holiday. And I remember another quote from somebody who was who had worked an unbelievable number of hours and they were getting into their car to drive home and they actually weren't safe to drive. They felt, you know, that they shouldn't be driving because they were so exhausted. Um, it's just two examples of extreme jobs. The fact that you have to even yeah. arrange your own cover when you are sick, it's unheard of in any other role that you would be required to do that. So you have to put another colleague in the position of, of doing a shift. Maybe they're already exhausted as well. Um, why don't they speak up? Why don't doctors, you know, if it was anybody else in any other role, you would, you know, say to your manager, this is not really acceptable, or I, I you know, I feel um, that this is extreme. Um, so why don't these doctors speak up? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm not sure that I have uh, an answer for it. I mean, we've, we've, we've done some work on voice and I think um, sometimes they voice and actually I suppose the doctors in Australia felt more um, uh, felt happier to raise their concerns because they were in Australia. They'd already left the system and they felt kind of they'd already made that decision to leave. And then they were happy to talk about the working conditions in the Irish health system. I think that the junior hospital doctors in particular are quite vulnerable. They are um, generally on temporary short term contracts and their training lasts an awful long time. So post graduation, they might have. 10, 15 years of postgraduate training ahead of them, all on short term contracts. They're quite vulnerable um, to raise. They don't feel safe to raise concerns a lot of the time because they feel that it might negatively impact on their careers. So I think that's a real issue. Um, I think it, it, it's 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 really strange when you compare it to any other work work workforce, you know, that people wouldn't have that would be, you know, they'd all share stories of crashing their cars on the way home after after a very long shift. It's kind of just um, war stories. They'd all all have stories like that, which is um, ridiculous. Um, but it's just, I suppose it's just the way it's always been. And I think um, perhaps medicine is, is slower to change than other professions in terms of um, bringing things up to speed in terms of, 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 of having working conditions that are comparable to other industries. I think it's kind of really been in a bubble on its own and it's just the way things always are. So I think that's quite difficult. I think the, the junior doctors are quite vulnerable within the system um, to speak up. Um, yeah. Um, I have another question. How did the general cost of living in Australia compare to Ireland during that period examined in your research? Um, I think salaries were higher um, in Australia for the doctors who'd left, um, but that really wasn't the reason that they left Ireland. They really left Ireland to improve their working conditions, to maybe get a break from the system. It's only when they got out there and they maybe progressed and, and made consultant that they realised the, the differences in um, in salary in Australia compared to Ireland, what they really noticed immediately when they got there was the working hours. The working hours were set. They knew when they were going to go to work and they knew when they were going to clock out to work, um, clock out of work. And they just had that certainty. 
which was missing in Ireland. And that made a huge difference. So you might go from working 100 hour weeks um, to working a 40 hour week as standard. And I think that certainty made a huge difference to work life balance. And then you've got the quality of life over there. So I think salary came up in terms of um, preventing people from moving home, but it really wasn't why they left um, for the most part. The only exception to that really was the, um, the doctors that had gone um, graduate entry doctors in Ireland. So uh, about five, six years ago, Ireland introduced graduate entry medicine. So post-grad medicine. And those doctors have, have spent a lot of money on their education. The fees would be about 50,000 a year. They'd, they'd leave college with a lot of debt. And they were the only doctors who were emigrating um, for, for financial reasons, for sure. And um, because they felt that the cost of living, the cost of rent in Dublin or the cost of rent in Ireland um, relative to salary was they would be able to pay off their debts much faster in Australia. So really money didn't come into it except for that um, cohort of graduate entry doctors who um, knew that they would struggle um, to, repay, to repay their debts really because in Ireland um, they tend, when they finish um, medicine, they can be rotated anywhere in the country. So sometimes they'll be double renting. They'll, they'll have a place in Dublin, but they'll have to rent in, in Cork or Donegal or wherever they are posted to. So it's that double rent um, as well as your debt repayments, which really make people struggle to make any inroad into their debt um, after graduation. And I suppose they had entered graduate entry medicine um, uh, probably eight, eight years ago or six years ago, whatever, um, with the expectation maybe of, of, of different salaries or different rents when they came out. So they were the only ones who really mentioned um, finances as, as a reason for emigration. And to think that you're working 100 hours a week and you still can't make ends meet, you know? Yeah, or double jobbing. Um, I, I had people in Australia talk about double jobbing, trying to take on another job, uh, you know, on top of medicine to try and, 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 and that's just not sustainable. I mean, people were getting sick and um, yeah. I'm just gonna ask you have another question as well, but just maybe on the Australia thing. Um, can you share what the differences were between Australia and Ireland in terms of, first of all, the general working atmosphere and your relationships with senior colleagues in Australia versus Ireland um, and the informal relationships maybe. And the second thing is the technology in Australia compared to Ireland. Yeah, really good question. Um, so where to start um the working the senior colleagues there was a huge difference in the availability of senior staff in australia they have more consultants um, per head of population so senior colleagues are just more um they're kind of available to them they're, they're working side by side with them there's not there's plenty of them so it's it's no problem to find a consultant to run something by them and um, simply because there's more of them in the health system compared to ireland um, they felt that the, the communication with their senior colleagues in Australia was very informal and um, first name terms, no, no professors. So you didn't have to use their title, whereas here they, they said that in a lot of cases you need to use a title. So if you're an intern and you're wanting to ask a professor a question and you, you need to find the professor and you need to refer to them correctly in order to, to get your, you might be less, you might be far more um, reluctant to raise your concern with a senior colleague than if it's um, Mary or Frank, you know, who, who, who you work side by side and, and you're far more familiar with. Um, so that kind of informality was, was hugely significant um, for doctors. Um, who, who, who are kind of still learning, you know, they're still in training and they felt it much easier to approach senior colleagues for advice if they had this kind of informal basis um, of, of, of talking with them. Um, the technology, yeah, hugely different. Um, one example in Australia was um, uh, interns are each given an iPad with their um, work tasks on the iPad. And then if one intern gets swamped, um, they're, they're um, their work list is, is updated automatically in real time by a senior member of staff. So rather than having to just keep going until you've got this long list of tasks completed, somebody is watching and, and um, regulating your um, workload today so that you're never gonna be completely swamped, that, if, that your work will be continually be reallocated across the team so that everybody gets through the work um, and everybody gets out on time. Um, what else about Ireland, Australia? Um, they had really interesting um, way of, of, of um, job crafting, which I thought was really interesting. 
Um, so senior hospital, senior consultants would often be hired on an 80% or a 60% contract um, rather than 100%. And they would have an option to add in, to add, to keep adding work until they made 100% or maybe just to work flexibly. So most jobs weren't 100%. They were maybe 80 or 60% time. And as, as if you wanted to do research, you could, you could increase the proportion of time you spent on research. If you like leadership roles, you could take on a leadership role that would, um, that would fit alongside your clinical role. So that really allowed people to craft their jobs and play to their strengths. And I think that was hugely, um, the, the doctors that I spoke to really, really appreciated that. So at different stages in their career for completely different reasons, they could change the content of their job and they could ch uh, change, you know, depending on what they liked or depending on what their home circumstances were, they could work less than full time. That was no problem. It wasn't a question of having to um, beg or try and organize parental leave. It was just you only had a 60 percent job. You did your 60 percent job. So I thought that was really interesting in terms of retaining people for a longer and happier career and um, that people could be flexible and organize a job to fit them and to fit their strengths as they progress through their careers, um, which isn't the case here. It's more a case of taking on responsibility and just trying to balance it all yourself, you know? Um, so I thought that was really interesting in Australia. I have another question here and it really is, it's from Anthony and it really is about, you know, how sustainable is this situation for Ireland? You know, when we're training so many doctors and then they're, 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 we're training them basically to go somewhere else and then taking doctors from very often developing economies and then leaving them short of their doctors. Um, Anthony wants to notice the high status you mentioned of doctors in society almost put blinkers on the many who want to do medicine in college. That is, they're simply ignoring the reality that the working conditions are so poor. Do they even know that? I'm surprised that this isn't putting young people off. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's it is surprising, but I suppose it is it has got such a prestige. I mean, um, I was reading a book where they say that even as you apply to medicine, your status in your family raises, you know, your granny's proud of you, your mom is proud of you, you know, people are delighted that you're gonna we're gonna have a doctor in the family. So I think I think people don't uh, connect the working conditions which are tough and are for a long time um with with the reality i think people enter medicine and by the time they realize how tough it is they've invested a lot of time and energy um into into their their career which is huge but i i, I think the sustainability is is a really key question because we do 42 percent of our workforce are internationally trained so we are just taking doctors from other countries in order to make up the shortfall from failing to retain our own and i think i don't think that that would be considered a great um way to run any business um, really just having this huge churn in the system um, and then the the international doctors themselves often leave because they don't uh, because the working conditions aren't great for them either so I think there's a real need to stop changing the doctors in the system and start changing the working conditions with which they're all pretty much dis dissatisfied with and um, so I think retention is really key because the sustainability of it all particularly in the context of a global pandemic um, is 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 it's just not really sustainable to keep going with this this model you know can i ask you as well neve about the level of support that doctors get so if you're a junior doctor and you're working the night shift and you've a patient who's seriously ill and you need to make a clinical decision uh, what level of responsibility are being put on junior doctors or what supports would a junior doctor have on that night shift in order to be able to seek clinical guidance in the treatment of a patient yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to generalize, but, you know, some of the stories that we've heard would be quite chilling of, of quite junior doctors feeling feeling quite alone on the floor. Now, I'm not sure whether they were alone on the floor or they just felt that way, because sometimes to call on help is, is to kind of admit that you, you, you're not on top of your game, which is quite difficult to do. Um, but I think as a as a rule of thumb, the system is, is quite short staffed. And there's particular vacancies at a consultant level. So there's a lot of unfilled vacancies at consultant level. There's a lot of locums um, like agency staff at consultant level. So I think we Ireland definitely is understaffed at that senior level. Um, and I think that, that that needs to be addressed so that they they don't feel well, they shouldn't be isolated in making these these critical decisions, but they shouldn't feel isolated either. They should be quite clear about who's who's there to help them through and um, particularly at night um you know yeah 
Niamh, thanks so much. Um, you really would hope that with the crisis and what has happened and the interesting outcome is that rather than it deteriorating further, things actually improved. You would hope that now we could have more slack in the system to just improve uh, the, the conditions of our doctors, because who is going to mind the doctors after all? Um, and so uh, it, it is a, a, you know, a stark contrast in a way to the types of workers that, that James uh, was looking at, but it's still no, it's still not good. It's no better, you know. Um, Niamh, it's so interesting. Uh, the whole project is just really, really interesting. And thanks so much for sharing the various insights um, across the different phases uh, of the research. Um, okay, so on that note, I'd like to say a sincere thank you uh, to Niamh and to James. And hopefully everybody enjoyed that session. Um, it was really interesting, really good insights. Uh, I hope you will join uh, again tomorrow for the final of the Transform Work series. So once again, thanks James, thanks Neve, and thanks also to Molly in the background to make sure things go uh, very smoothly as always. So bye everyone and see you soon, bye. Bye. Thanks.